here you are. What does that mean? Here you are. Who is you? What makes you, you? This is one of those things that seems self-evident, but then when you start to dig into it, it becomes a little, um, a little bit not quite as clear, a little harder to define. And that's what we're going to dig into because in Jesus Christ, God meets you where you live. And somehow that makes who you are more concrete than it would have been otherwise. Of course, there is no otherwise because uh, Jesus has always been God's plan. Nevertheless, it's something to think about. Here you are. What does that mean? In Jesus Christ, it means a lot more than what it seems to mean. A reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 16. What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this Father of our Master, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it, proved pure. Genuine faith put through the suffering comes out, proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. The prophets who told us this was coming, was coming, asked a lot of questions about this gift of life, was preparing. The Messiah Spirit let them in on some of it, that the Messiah would experience suffering, followed by glory. They clamored to know who and when. All they were told was that they were serving you, you who by orders from heaven now have now heard for yourselves through the Holy Spirit, the message of those prophecies fulfilled. Do you realize how fortunate you are? 
angels would have given anything to, to have been in on this. So, roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old brews of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy, you be holy. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let me ask you a question. What makes you, you? I know, that's a big question, isn't it? There are many things that contribute to who you are. Nevertheless, I'd, I'd like us to try to answer. What makes you, you? And to give you some time to think, I'll talk. First of all, keep in mind that you can use the range of this question as an advantage. You don't have to drill down to just one thing. You can come up with multiple answers. For instance, and because it's only fair, I'll go first. I'd say part of what makes me, me, is that I'm curious and, and I'm judgmental. I'm judgmental. Now, I don't like to admit that last part, but I am, and it, it drives me up the wall. Uh, honestly, I do not like that I'm judgmental. Believe me, this frame of mind, it often boomerangs around back on me, and when that happens, I become the one I'm, judge. I'm judging. It's no fun, but if you suffer from the same affliction, I don't need to tell you how unpleasant it is, do I? Plus, being judgmental does not serve my curiosity. And it's my curiosity that I like. Curiosity gets its vim and vigor from being open-minded. And obviously, obviously a judgmental attitude is anything but. However, whether I like it or not, there it is. There it is. Part of what makes me, me are these two characteristics, one that I like and one that I don't, and that both of these characteristics are at odds with each other. What about you? What makes you, you? Uh, go ahead and, and try and come up with an answer and, and remember that you're free. What makes you, you? You can um, write your answer in the comments or reach out to me and let me know. Now, you can hit pause if you need more time. That'd probably be a good idea. The questions at the beginning may have prompted you to. But I wonder, as you thought about the question and you tried to answer, did you have any breakthroughs? Did you discover any conflicting characteristics like me? Did you learn something new about yourself? Or was it just hard? Because the truth is, we can be kind of oblivious to ourselves, can't we? Or what about this? Did you, did you answer the question differently? <clears throat> the question was wide open, wasn't it? And, and yes, I led you down a particular path with the way I answered, but that doesn't mean you had to follow. Uh, you didn't have to answer with attributes. You could have named some event, some event in your life that makes you you. Or you could have answered with a person. Or you could have answered with family history or biology. Why, you could have even gone with the safe Sunday school answer and said, God is what makes you, you. Did you answer the question differently? I wonder. And you can let me know that too. Because really, it's a very big question, isn't it? And honestly, not a one of the answers totally captures what makes you, you. You can't just pin down who you are, can you? I have a theory for why this is, 
And it's not my theory. It comes to us from today's scripture. The reason we can't definitively say what makes us us is twofold. First of all, we're not a static thing. We're not just one thing forever and ever. We change. And more importantly, we can't say uh, who we are because it's not for us to say who we are. We don't determine what makes us us. We do not define ourselves. In fact, it's the other way around. We are defined. Our, ident our identity is what others say of us. You are who your country defines you as. You are who your neighbors define you as. You are who your friends define you as. You are who your family defines you as. And this is because deep down, you are who God defines you as. You are who God defines you as. What makes us isn't us, it is what others say of us. And this is true deep down because this is true of how we were made in the image of God. So let's get into it. Now the first thing to say is, I know this can sound abstract, but this isn't some philosophical concept I'm talking about. The truth is, you already have plenty of hands-on experience with this. Many of you know that you didn't become who you are in any meaningful sense until, until, well, someone else called it out of you. For instance, you don't become mother or father. You don't become mother or father until your child calls it out of you. And this, it's not like it happens just once and then it's done, does it? No, it, it, it keeps happening. In fact, first it begins before words, it begins with cries, but then it continues with each time that other person calls you mother or father, doesn't it? However, as I alluded to, and as we all know, this isn't a fixed identity. What I mean is, well, one of the most painful rifts in the family is when a child refuses to call their mother or father or brother or sister as such. And when that happens, a part of you effectively ceases to be that person. That is why deaths are so hard. It's not just the person who dies. So does a part of us. The part of us that was defined by our relationship with the person who died, dies with that person, doesn't it? And this brings us to the peril of this fact of our existence. Frankly, frankly, it can, be, it can be a little scary to let others define us, can't it? Often it seems safer just to shore up our own identity ourselves. And I will grant you, the prospect is tempting. Heck, I fall prey to it way more often than I wish I did. Come to think of it, come to think of it, this tendency is probably very closely connected with my being judgmental. But the, the bigger problem with trying to define ourselves is that it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. Insisting that you are the person who determines who you are is a surefire way to never really being anyone at all. First of all, you will see everyone else as a threat. And secondly, all you will have to define yourself is yourself. You will become that Ouroboros, the, the snake that eats its own tail. What seems like the safe route is really the most treacherous one. It's how you cut yourself off from life itself. And should you go down that road, you will have died hundreds of deaths before you are finally buried. When your final day arrives, there will be nothing left for you to say who you were, and there will be nobody left to tell you either. It's tragic. It's tragic. In fact, the word for being our own maker is autonomy. It's a popular word. You may have heard it bandied about. 
to be autonomous is to be the one who defines yourself. But the etymology of this word is instructive. Autonomy comes from two different Greek words, auto and nomos. Autonomy. Auto nomos. Auto, auto nomos. Autonomy. And you already know what auto means. Auto means self. As in automatic. Something is automatic because it works all by itself. Auto means self. And nomos means law. Honestly, I, I can't think of any other English words that have nomos in it. <laughs> but trust me, nomos means law. And if you can't bring yourself to trust me, well, rude. <laughs> but um, put it into Google and test me on this, N-O-M-O-S, N-O-M-O-S. It's a Greek word. You'll see, you inveterate sinner, uh, that I am telling you the truth. What this means is to be autonomous is to be a law unto yourself. Think about that. To be autonomous is to be a set of rules for yourself. How dreary. How dreary. We think if we can just define ourselves, we will be free. However, the opposite is true. When we seek to define ourselves, we imprison ourselves in ourselves. To really be alive is to be open to what others have to say about you. And yes, this can be risky. I would be lying. I would be lying if I told you no one can misuse this fact of your existence. Nevertheless, the greater risk to who you are is playing it so safe that you refuse to open yourself up to others. Doing so amounts to closing yourself off from all that gives life. And that's what today's scripture aims to cure you and me of. The first recipients of this letter, like us, lived in a culture where they were constantly told that they had to make something of themselves. The elder at St. Peter's, though, wants you to know you are not doomed to that dead-end existence. Instead, Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, instead, in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has broken the silence on you and me. God has said something about us in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Now, now you are no longer defined by yourself. Now you are defined by what the triune God has to say about you. And do you want to know what God has to say? Well, quit trying to answer that question for yourself. And instead, just listen. Listen. You are defined by the word of God spoken clearly over you in the church. The church is where God breaks the silence on you. You are defined by words like, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are defined by words like, his body given for you and his blood shed for you. For you, you are defined by words like, all your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. And one quick word. If you need to be baptized, or if you'd like to receive communion, or meet with me for a personal time of absolution, just reach out to the church. We can arrange that easy peasy. You are not what you accomplish or fail to accomplish. You are not defined by your past or your resolve to bring about a brighter future. No, you are defined by God's love for you. God says you're mine. God says you're a keeper. And do you want to know why God says this? No reason. No reason. God just likes the thought of you. As far as... God is concerned the party would be incomplete without you. And so, and so over and over and over and over again, out of a great never-ending eternal love, God says your name. God says your name. I wish I was in the room with you so I could say your name and you could hear what God has to say about you. 
you no longer have to define yourself. Now you can just rest in who God in who God has spoken out of you. And you can rest in this identity come what may. God is so set upon saying your name in love that God says it all the way unto even the grave. When Christ is laid in the tomb, God forever ratifies this word spoken over you. Now in Christ's death, nothing can make God take back what God has said on you. Not even death itself could get Christ to stop saying your name in love. And when God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raises this Jesus Christ from the dead, God gives your name staying power too. Now, just like Mary on that very first Easter, when you hear, when you hear the resurrected Son speak your name, you too will recognize the sound of 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 your shepherd's voice and follow him into the forever green pastures of paradise. And you should know this is true for your loved ones who have followed Christ home too. That is why it didn't sound altogether correct when I said a part of our identity ceases when the loved one dies. In Christ, that tie, that bind survives. And no matter what, we continue, we continue to be the friend, parent, child, or spouse of the deceased. As Augustine said when he reflected on the death of a friend, and remember, uh, this comes from his confession, so this means Augustine's praying. So in the quote I'm about to read, when Augustine says you, he's speaking to God. But as Augustine says about his friend, Now he lives in Abraham's bosom, whatever is meant by the word bosom. My friend, my sweet friend, but your adoptive son lives there. What other place could there be for a soul like that? He lives there in the place he asked so many questions about, asked me a joke of a person who didn't know a thing about it. Now he doesn't put his ear to my lips. Instead, he puts his lips to the spirit of your spring and drinks all he can hold, wisdom in proportion to his thirst for it, in an ecstasy without end. And I don't think he gets so drunk he forgets about me, since you, Master, whom he's guzzling, remember us. That's enough, isn't it? more than enough even. But God is so very gracious. God has even more in store. Now God invites you into the discussion. That's all prayer is, isn't it? God is so committed to you that that God welcomes you into the conversation about you. God is so open to you. God takes your input into consideration. And still there is more. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you too can carry on this conversation with others. Now you can say words like, I'm sorry, forgive me. Or, I forgive you. Or, I love you. Or, I love you too. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, these words are more than just words. They are true. And they truly give life too and not just for others either. No, you too will catch the rhythm of that sacred thrum of the heartbeat of your own life as you speak these words. And this is good news, not just for you, but for the world. Remember how we said that we're defined by all these other people who define us, and I even acknowledge it can be risky? The world is clearly tearing itself up, dying to hear words that are trustworthy and words that are good that define others and in christ you you can like the prodigal sower in that parable scatter these words scatter these words graciously scatter these words with abandon because in christ your identity is assured And because in Christ, these words are true. And because by the power of the Holy Spirit, these words give life. 
And so seeing as you have all that, now you are free to share it with others. And as you do, you will discover the depths and the veracity of these words on you too. So we're going to take some time to practice that conversation. We'll have a time of prayer, of you entering into that conversation with God about who you are and discovering that God listens to you and that you too might discover the pleasure of listening to what God has to say about you. Blessings. And now, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, that's what we'll do. We'll have a little bit of time, too, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice.
Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now as we prepare to conclude this service, um, there's always plenty going on this summer. We've got a few big uh, studies that we're excited about. There's always Bible study. We've got activities for the youth. And a very fine way to check that out is to join us here for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. or um, check out our website. And at the end of the service, it'll have our website. And you could shoot us a message from our email, which our website lists, or check us out on social media and send us a message that way, or give us a call. We'd love to be in chat. Those are the best ways to find out what's happening in real time. But now, now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.